Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight, Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, what's in the AP African American Studies course that Florida has already banned from its schools? The Cook County State's Attorney's Office is dropping its case against embattled singer R. Kelly. Kim Fox explains why. A throwback to the surprising story behind a Chicago pizza empire's name, architecture critic Lee Bay shows off the South Side in a special airing on WTTW. She played with the Negro Leagues and that in and of itself was incredible. And the story of the first woman to hit a home run for baseball's Negro Leagues takes center stage in a new show. All that's coming up, but our first story tonight, controversy over what is taught in black history classes. We explain right after this. Chicago Tonight, Black Voices is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. It is the first week of Black History Month, but exactly how that black history should be taught in our schools is being debated. This week, the College Board, that's the nonprofit that oversees the advanced placement program in schools, released its updated curriculum for its AP African American Studies after much criticism from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Here he is talking about one of his objections. What's one of the lessons about? Queer theory. Now, who would say that an important part of black history is queer theory? That is somebody pushing an agenda on our kids. We're going to come back to that, but the board says the adjustments made had nothing to do with Florida's ban on the course. Joining us now are E. Patrick Johnson, Dean of the Northwestern University School of Communication, and State Representative LaShawn Ford. Thanks to you both for joining us. E. Patrick Johnson, we just heard Governor Ron DeSantis refer to something that is in your wheelhouse. Uh, some of the content in the pilot version included a topic, um, black queer theory. Explain that theory first, if you would, um, but why was it included in the pilot curriculum? Well, I, I believe that um, our history includes the history of people who are LGBTQ, um, myself being one of them. And um, queer theory is um, just one aspect of how we incorporate sexuality in the story of African American history from talking about those who contributed um, to that history who were gay uh, to how we analyze you know different texts that deal with sexuality representative ford how's the approach to teaching history changed since you were a teacher and since you yourself were a student well it's now i think that what we have now is more of a desire to have an inclusive history i mean when i taught i didn't even know that james baldwin was a gay man so i think that what we see now is the conservatives fighting to keep history as it was. And that's not what we call inclusive. And I think America, regardless to whether you're white, black, or brown, we want inclusive history and we want it accurate. E. Patrick Johnson, the College Board has said that uh, this revision that it is released this week was part of the normal process for an AP course, having nothing to do with Florida's decision to ban the course before Florida even mm -hmm. saw it. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, that that might be true. I don't think it's necessarily um, totally true. I mean, there's a lot of political pressure, a lot of blowback. Um, but it, it is true that all of these courses have a, a preliminary a test run in, in all of the uh, schools uh, for a year, and then things are recalibrated. I think that queer theory in particular, it's the theory part. Uh, that might have been a bit much for um, some high school students uh, because it, it's at a higher level of thinking. Um, but you know, as the representative said, there are certainly uh, black gay um, folk who are critical to African American history, like James Bald Baldwin, like Audre Lorde, uh, and others who, you know, you can't get around teaching uh, them as a part of our history. One of the sections that was dropped is on the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. uh, which you know current modern day students um, have been alive to witness. Of course, what are your thoughts on on omitting that section? 
Um, I think it's a missed opportunity because it fits in with a, a longer history of social movements in African American history, uh, from the civil rights movement uh, and even before that, you know, the black nationalist movement. So it's a missed opportunity, I believe, to omit uh, something that is actually instrumental in the current students' lives. Representative Ford, uh, give us a sense, what's the purpose of AP courses? Who are the students taking them and why? I think that when you think of AP courses, those are advanced placement courses as it stands for. And what we know now is that if you have a student that want to take advanced placement course in African-American studies, that means that there's a desire. And in America, you have the right to um, go after your desire in learning. And so and as the chair of higher ed approach, we have people taking um, liberal arts education. And so this is something that people want to do as high schoolers. And that means that they're gonna help us shape their accurate history when they go to college. And that's great when we have people that want to incorporate African-American studies in the real American history so that we can have an accurate accounting of American history. And we need people that have a desire in that part of American history. And that's a contribution to our history in America. And of course, you know, one of the important pieces of an AP curriculum is that students have the opportunity to take a test and earn college credit um, going forward. E. Patrick, would you say the subjects in the original curriculum are appropriate for the level of learning for high school juniors and seniors? Absolutely. I mean, I, if you think about the students today were born with the world in their pocket vis-a-vis -vis their phone. So they have access to the world in the ways in which my generation, your generation, and parents' generation did not have access to. So they're a lot smarter than what we give them credit. And I think that in order to prepare them for the demands of college, an AP course in African American history that really drills down into all aspects of that history is necessary. Uh, Representative Ford, Governor Pritzker, stated his objections to the course revision, sending a letter to the college board, uh, calling it a watered down, uh, watering down of history if the college board should bow to uh, the, the criticism of Florida. Uh, legislatively speaking, do you see a ban like what's happening in Florida, happening in Illinois? Well, not in Illinois. In fact, uh, what we've done as the Black Caucus and the legislature, we have a pillar that make sure that we're working to have accurate history taught in our schools. And we wanna make sure that it's inclusive, that we include the black, the brown, the gay, the straight, and the women, the contributions that have been made from all people, not just one sector. And we know that the current history that's been written is one-sided. It's been written by a white man and things are changing in our society. More people are interested in the truth. E. Patrick, since this is an AP course, most high school students won't actually be taking this. Mm -hmm. Why is that important to point out? It, because it, it, you know, it is optional and it t takes a certain level of um, uh, curiosity uh, and grades uh, to get into an AP course. And so it's sort of self-selecting in that way. And so, but the way in which it's been presented by dissenters and others as indoctrination as opposed to education. And that is a misnomer and it's a mischaracterization. And, you know, it's political theater for his own purposes. And most of us see through that. Representative Ford, we've got about 25 seconds. You've suggested in the past that Illinois abolish history courses entirely until a suitable alternative is developed. Are curricula like an AP course? Is that, uh, in your estimation, considered a, a suitable alternative? It's inclusive and it's allowing other people to the table. And what we know is in order to have an accurate account of history, you have to have more people, a diverse people, to help get the accounting of American history. And this AP course is inclusive and it includes um, history from different perspectives. And that's what takes, um, that's what it takes to make an accurate accounting of American history. And I'm enjoying the dispute between the dissenters and the people. I'm happy that he's come out to say that he's against it because it gives us a chance to collaborate and make it right.
And of course, we'll see what the future holds for Governor DeSantis. For now, that is where we'll have to leave it. Uh, Dean E. Patrick Johnson and Representative LaShawn Ford, thanks to you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And we're back with more Chicago Tonight Black Voices right after this. Cook County's nearly four-year case against disgraced singer R. Kelly ends with the charges being dropped. Kelly was facing multiple counts of sexual assault and abuse. Last year, he was convicted in a federal court in New York and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Months later, he was convicted in another federal court, this one in Chicago. Kelly is scheduled to be sentenced in that case next month and faces 10 to 90 years in prison. Earlier this week, Paris Schutt spoke with Cook County State's attorney, Kim Fox, about her decision to drop those state charges. Essentially, Mr. Kelly is looking at, even before we got to the state cases, spending the rest of his life in prison. And so as a result of that, uh, we believe that justice has been served um, and our resources are best suited for dealing with cases um, that are pending in Cook County now. I, I do want to quote one of those victims, Lenita Cardo, who, who was involved in the county's case. Uh, part of our statement said, quote, over the past several weeks, I came to learn the state's attorney's office was considering dismissing these cases. I pleaded with Kim Fox and her team to see the cases through. Justice has been denied for me a second time, making today's decision that much more difficult to comprehend and accept. So I understand the notion that Kelly couldn't really have any more punishment than he already has, but what about this particular victim and the feeling that justice is being denied her right now? You know, listen, I met with uh, Lenita Carter a few months ago. Uh, she came forward way back in 2003 and shared what happened to her, went to authorities, did everything um, that she thought she was supposed to do to get justice, um, and nothing happened. And so here we were, 20 years later, we asked for victims to come forward, and she did. And so I can totally sympathize that she wanted her chance to get into the box and point to him and say what he had done. But the reality is that we have a man who is not going to get any additional time, who is in prison for the remainder of his life right now with the sentence that he has. And that sense of the use of our resources for someone who's been convicted of sex crimes, it is more appropriate for us to stop where we are now, allow her to say what has happened to her, um, but we don't believe that we should continue these cases in the court of law. That was a portion of our conversation with Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox. You can watch the full interview on our website. Up next, the architecture of Chicago's South Side. There's more to Chicago's architectural legacy than its gleaming downtown skyline. All throughout the city, there are buildings that inspire. You just have to know where to look. Well, Leve knows where to look. In his special Building Blocks, the architecture of Chicago's South Side, Bay tours some of the South Side treasures he says you have to know if you want to know Chicago. Here's a preview. From historically groundbreaking structures to modern masterpieces to lesser known works from famous architects, the South Side contains block after block of some of the best spaces you'll find anywhere in the city. I'm going to take you on a tour of just a few of these often overlooked marvels of engineering and design and help you get to know some of the brightest gems of the city's architectural treasure. And Lee Bay joins us tonight to talk about it. Welcome back, Lee. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good to be here. So, of course, as you know, the South Side is full of architectural treasurers, but you had to get the list down to just nine for building blocks. Uh, <laughs> what do the nine sites that you chose, what do they tell us about the South Side of Chicago? You know, that, was a, that was a tough cut to make, uh, but I wanted to show, we wanted to show um, a variety of places. So there's churches, there are their homes, uh, public buildings like schools, uh, just to show that there's a wide variety of places that are architecturally worthy in Chicago and that they're throughout the south, uh, and that they're throughout the south side. Uh, some of Chicago's most famous and beautiful parks are on the south side. You chose Auburn Park, which 
could fairly be called a hidden gem. Why is that? You know, it really is. Years ago, I gave a lecture, and I showed this, and two women who, from the neighborhood who lived two blocks south came to me and said, we never knew this was there. Uh, it's uh, roughly 78th and Eggleston. It looks like a, um, you know, it could be a slice of Washington Park or, Gar or, or Columbus Park uh, placed there. Uh, it's a two-block long street uh, surrounded by a park with a lagoon that runs right down the middle. The most unexpected thing you want to see in the city, and it's in fantastic condition. The neighbors rallied around it around 20 or 30 years ago, 25 years ago, and uh, and saved it. And you know, you can relax, you can fish. It's a it's a really great spot. Yeah, we're looking at some aerial video of it as you were speaking, and it's a beautiful summer day in Chicago that day. Um, so mm -hmm. you also got to not one but two Chicago public high schools uh, featured in the, the documentary, Chicago Vocational and Bowen. How important were public buildings like high schools to building the South Side? You know, very much so. I mean, Chicago's South Side, like much of the city, experienced this great population growth uh, in the last century, uh, between the wars especially, especially a little bit after. So to be able to build facilities uh, that can educate the, 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 these new arrivals, whether they, whether they be immigrants from overseas or uh, migrants, uh, southern migrants from the south, and rather than to warehouse people in boxes, you know, devoted to education, they really went through the trouble, the school system, to provide these architecturally significant buildings, which puts a bit of nobility, if you will, to the act of public education. And of course, one of those high schools is your alma mater. Yes, uh, Chicago Vocational. I had to put that in there, uh, but I also want to get I also want to get Bowen in there too. Bowen probably is even more overlooked in a sense than Chicago Vocational is. You can see CVS as you leave town on the Skyway. Bowen, which is the twin of Schur's High School, is on 89th Street, East 89th Street in the South Chicago community, and many people haven't seen it. So, uh, showing it there and in my book, people are often surprised. I didn't know this was here. I think that's right, but now you do. Okay. Uh, you've always been a big South Side booster, of course. Do you think the city does enough to promote the South Side in the public imagination and the understanding of Chicago? You know, it's, it's getting there now. I mean, I think civically you see in the news uh, projects that are happening on the South Side, you know, you know, new projects that are happening in a way that you didn't see it reported on probably even 20 or 30 years ago. And certainly on the tourist front, you know, when I was in here, I was born here, and the, the tourist maps would be uh, they would literally go dark uh, beyond Roosevelt Road, with the exception maybe of Hyde Park. But now you, you hear people talking about the restaurants on 75th Street, like Limbs or uh, out in Pullman, where I am. Uh, the stuff that's happening here, preservation-wise. So slowly, slowly, the light is turning on. Um, in the documentary, you talk a little bit about some of the things that surprised you, uh, even for a man who knows as much about the South Side as you do. And you say that you were a bit surprised uh, by the size of the South Side alone. You know, it is. It's, it's half, a little bit more than half the city's landmass. So it's, uh, it's a city within a city. You know, when others talk and think about the South Side, it's often talked about as it's uh, someplace south of Roosevelt Road, but it's really, you know, it's a fair-sized city. And when you think about it that way, then the fixes for the South Side, who were fixes on crime, social issues, development, they have to be of a city scale. And, um, and, and I think that was a, the surprise to me. I didn't, know, I didn't know this when you were a kid. If you lived in Avalon Park like I did, and you had an aunt who lived in Auburn Gresham or Washington uh, Heights, it took you forever to get there. But it really <laughs> is big. Um, so that was a surprise to me. Especially for non-Chicagoans, they uh, they come to understand it pretty well once uh, once you start taking that trip south, and you're still in Chicago. Um, <laughs> what are you hoping folks uh, take away from building blocks? Well, you know, I want people who um, you know perhaps are not familiar with the South Side to see it, to experience it, to see that you know some of the things you read and hear about the South Side. Not saying it isn't true, uh, but but it, but there's a but there's a scale to it. There's a perspective to it. There are these other things architecturally going on here as well. Like we're, we're architect neighborhoods, you know, by with people who are caring and, and saving and, and preserving these buildings. Uh, but for people who live on the south side, my my countrymen, if you will, um, the the uh, you know building blocks and perhaps the the cutoff that it comes from, the southern exposure, is really like a pat on the back. It's it's an attaboy. It's a it's a it's an affirmation, a reaffirmation uh, that there is worth uh, on your side of the city. Uh, beautiful, uh, and, and it's time for it to be talked about and brought into the discussion of architecture, serious discussion of architecture in Chicago.
couple of seconds left, Lee. We're obviously talking about places that still exist, but if you could bring back one lost treasure on the South Side, what would it be? Ooh, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm going to say the South Town Theater. Look this up if you have it. It used to be at 63rd, I think, in Peoria. It was a Spanish Art Deco theater, 3,000 seats, and its heyday flamingo pools on the inside. It closed in the 50s, <laughs> became a department store uh, for a while, and then got torn down in 1990. If I could bring that back, snap my fingers like that, oh, so reverse and bring it back. Uh, South Town Theater. You. Performances mm -hmm. for everybody. We've all got our homework. Lee Bay, good to see you. Thanks so much. <laughs> good to see you. Thank you. And you can catch the premiere of Building Blocks, the architecture of Chicago's South Side, Monday evening at 9 on WTTW. Back in the day here at Chicago Tonight, contributor Stan Lawrence hosted segments that took a look back at the neighborhoods, businesses, and people who built black Chicago. In this 2005 throwback, Lawrence talked to pizza entrepreneur John Clark Jr. about why he named his empire not Clark Pizza, but Reggio's Pizza. We were looking for a name for the company. We couldn't call it Clark Pizza. Though. That wouldn't have gone <laughs> over. So uh, we had to watch this movie called Shaft. Uh -huh. And uh, the music score was Walk from Reggio's and Reggio's Cafe. And of oh. course, the, uh, the music score was written by Isaac Hayes, mm -hmm. an African-American. The movie was directed and produced by Gordon Parks, right. another African-American. Mm -hmm. And uh, the star of the movie was Richard Roundtree. We decided to name it Reggio's because that is as close to African American, uh, uh, Italian, and successful as we could get. The movie was successful, mm -hmm. so that's why we named it Reggio. Today, Reggio's has two locations on the south side and three at O'Hare Airport. You can also find their frozen pizzas at grocery stores all over Chicago. America's favorite pastime is taking center stage in a new production at the Goodman Theater. Arts correspondent Angel Edo introduces us to the two women behind Tony Stone. I think it's of the utmost importance to play iconic characters who we've never heard of. I, I didn't, and I played baseball from five to like 12 and then softball all of my life, and I had never heard of this iconic woman. It's the story of Toni Stone, the first woman to play in baseball's Negro Leagues. Stone was rejected by the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League because of her race. So she instead joined an all-men's baseball team, the Indianapolis Clowns, to play second base. Some of the obstacles that she faced, um, part of that being, you know, her, her mother, you know, not being as supportive. You know, she wanted her to do what is considered traditional woman things. And Tony was proficient in baseball and many other sports, but baseball was the thing uh, that she loved the most. Um, so it follows her journey playing in an all male sport. Um, some of the things that she had to do to fit in um, and some of the things that she had to kind of compromise um, herself to be able to be in this sport. On stage at the Goodman Theater, playwright Lydia Diamond says one of the elements she wanted to highlight was that despite Stone's challenges, she'd achieved her goals. The story I'm telling is about Toni Stone, and some of the things that she encountered were these horrible things. It made not what white people have done to us the story. It was important to me that that not be the story, a thing I don't see on stage as much as I would like. I wanted to see a group of men hold up a black woman and help her tell her story. So the men play different characters. They're, the men play women. Uh, they play, someone plays her mother, someone plays a, a priest. They, they play white people and black people. And um, it's exciting. I told you guys I got a hit off Satchel Page. Yes. yes! I wanted to see Toni Stone on the stage by herself the way she would be. And the, because it, it is compelling to me the idea of a woman pushing her way into this world that didn't necessarily even want her, being so successful, and that's part of the story of her story. Set in the 1950s, the story aims to celebrate Stone's home runs despite the racist and sexist barriers. Tracy Bonner, who plays Stone, says it's a celebration of who she is, not necessarily what she did. You can do anything, and she says it in the play, you can do anything if you work real hard, right? Um, and I, 
if you believe in yourself and if you fight for what you believe in and what who you think you are and who you want to be, I, I think that is the biggest takeaway. Always fight for, for who you are and know that you are enough. For Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Angel Edo. And you can see Tony Stone at the Goodman Theater through February 26th. And that's our show for this weekend. If you're watching us on Saturday night, know that you can also catch Black Voices and Latino Voices on Sundays beginning at 10 p.m. And join me and Paris Schutz next week at 10 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud to be a multilingual law firm that provides translators for a variety of languages.